Um, although I don't think the cameras ever stop me from saying really awesome things. No. So, <laughs> I get myself in trouble a lot. I'll, I go to conferences and I'm like, oh, I ain't going to jail for that, aren't I? <laughs> That's it. She's got she's gonna teach all weekend because I'm not gonna be here Sunday. I'll be here. Today. Yeah, it should be all the bathrooms working. Yeah, anybody needs it. Basically a bathroom in every hallway, so you go out and around, left or right. The real bathroom is to the left. <laughs>
Am I doing on time? I'm doing all right. Hey, we got a few people on there. Hi, folks. Get a refill. We got started here. I'm like, I don't know. What time is it? Oh, five minutes. Awesome. Much better, actually. I was mean. I chased her away. So I was like, no, you got to teach all day, this, or all weekend. So I was like, yeah. yeah. This, one. yeah. this one's easy. And I, I warned a few people, but I'll, I don't usually start by ranting, but I'm going to start when we start. I'm going to actually rant a little bit. I got an email. Rant away, I do. Yeah, I don't know why. I figured a bunch of people walked by him, so I figured I'd just hand him out. Uh, old class schedule. We got no one coming out next week, but hey, it's got stuff on its propaganda. <laughs> oh.
Yeah, I can almost see. Occasionally, I have a few AP show up. So. Well, I say I go ahead and get started just because it looks like everybody's here that matters, right? I'm sure people are wondering as we go. Um, lots of new faces, which I always enjoy. If you don't know, I'm Bob. Um, this is my home. Might as well be. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this real fast. So we've got, we packed a lot into a really small space here. Oh, that's fine. I'm supposed to stand by the camera so the camera can see if you can hear me. Sorry, everybody. Um, so we've got four acupuncture physicians here who are all herbalists. We have a couple of herbalists uh, that have graduated from the program that practice here. We've got um, an herbal program that has both Western and Chinese herbal medicine um, from beginner all the way through clinicians. So it, each one of them is a two-year program that in the last year and a half of the Chinese program and the last year of the Western herbal program, you're actually doing clinical practice one night a week. So um, it's a little intense, but it's good stuff. And for the Western program in particular, you don't have to go all the way through it. It's set up so like everybody should take 101 which is everything your grandmother used to know, um, you know, before there was a CVS on every single corner. Uh, and then we do lots of free classes here as well. And it's one of our things that, kind of our mission statement, if you will, that it's really important to us that people regain the knowledge of herbal medicine. They, the idea that, you know, you gotta pay to come get it. And, you know, we're not gonna tell you anything. It's a big secret. You gotta go buy books and buy programs. No, this was what everybody knew back in the day. And so, yeah, you want to go on for a clinician and have us give up our weekends and evenings. Yeah, you got to throw a few bucks down. But for this, we try at least once, if not twice a month to do some sort of a free class. Um, and it's, except for the first five minutes, it's not a sales pitch. Um, I really want you guys to learn herb stuff. Uh, and we try to keep it as safe and user friendly as possible. It's ultimately all of you, if you had an issue, would know what to do at CVS to go and get a Tylenol, cough medicine, and everything like that with no medical training whatsoever. You just kind of know, right? You learned it on the internet, whatever. And so that used to be what everybody did with herbs. That for your basic day-to-day -day issues, everybody knew. Every mother, every grandmother, most of the children could go out, pull a weed out of the yard, and mash it on something and take care of themselves. We forgot. And so it's kind of, that's our mission. And I apologize, Renee's usually here doing the song and dance with me, but uh, she got sick two days ago with there's a nap around and luckily i didn't get it um so she's feeling way better but she's got to teach all weekend so i was like i got it get out of here i would be shocked if she doesn't come by and, and say hi at least later um we do have a few classes coming up we just added some things to it um this one i'm going to try to get ceus for it it's uh just a one day using topical uh herbs for pain and we're going to work from both a western and a chinese perspective we use some classical Chinese formulas and um, some very commonly used Western herbals 
to make poultices, liniments, um, and really looking at how we put them together, look at those energetics and apply them to specific points. We might add a few little fun things to that as well. That one's not free, unfortunately. Uh, September 20th, Herb Drug Interaction, one of my personal favorite classes to teach. Besides our wanting to make sure that everybody has access to those, the basic herbs, just because they're natural doesn't make them safe. Their herb, herb drug interactions are real. Um, and with some really basic precautions and quality control, it is okay to use herbs and drugs together. Come on in. <laughs> uh, so at least two times, sometimes four times a year, if time allows me, I make sure that I teach an herb drug interaction class. Because if somebody goes out and buys a, a, an herb without knowing about its potential interactions and has a problem, guarantee it's going to make the newspapers. It's going to make the news and it makes every herbalist and all herbs look scary and dangerous. So I don't want anybody to make that mistake. So we, we put it out there as often as we can. Um, October 25th, we're going to do a plant sale. Um, so we usually do that like noon to four, noon to five. We usually have, if you all don't know it, we have two plant singing machines. If you get really bored, um, go on YouTube and you can actually put in plant singing machines. It's basically a very simple device that uh, looks at the conductivity and the change in the plants that it vocalizes the plants. And so, you know, talk to your plants, pet them. That's a cute idea. And some people do it. Literally, the plants respond to our stimulus. And whether we say nice things or mean things, we light a match, we even think about fire, the plant will stop singing. And it's a, it changes our perspective of the plants a little bit when we see that. Yeah, all of our students have seen it way too many times and they're like, that's nuts. We have two, we have the old one and the new ones that we got about a year ago. Let me know you're gonna do another. Oh, that, we'll do that during the plants. Uh, the plants. So we usually plug it in just to freak people out. No, uh, but that evening we'll do another free lecture like this. Um, even though it's it's not too late, but I I'll, I'll just say for anybody who's listening, uh, if you currently grow stuff in your yard or you're really hoping to start growing food and medicine in your yard, now is kind of the time to start prepping your soil, getting some mulch, putting some amendments down. All of our heavy rains will start to break it down. The worms will start to do good stuff. Um, you don't have to be fanatical. By the end of September, you might want to start getting your plants in. By, by the end of October, beginning of November, you should have your plants in. And there's exceptions to that. You plant stuff all the time. I'm planting stuff right now. Um, but So we'll do the plant sale. And after that, we'll actually tell you what that could do with it. Uh, so we'll do a little bit about some of the unique uh, issues that we have with growing plants here in Florida with our heavy rains and high humidity. Um, for any of you who are new to the area, like, ah, I'm a transplant from Michigan, it's the opposite of what you know. Uh, so everything that works in Michigan does not work here. Um, and most of the plants that you grow there, yeah, some of them you can do in the wintertime. Um, if any of you are interested in the Chinese herbal program that starts in November, we only have one uh, start per year. We do it every year. Um, and that's coming up in November. We'll do an open house November 8th, which is just really an opportunity for us to like show off books and answer questions for people as a group. Um, the Western Herbal Program, we've got uh, 101, which is the start for the Western Program, but I also think everybody should take it. That's We've got one coming up in December and one in January, and I don't have the dates handy, but know that they're coming up soon. We only right now have two 101s coming up uh, in that time frame. They will fill up. So if you're like, I can't wait to do it, do it soon. Uh, <laughs> yes. um, oh, and I'm always plugging YouTube mainly because oh, we're at 580 some up subscribers. If we hit that magic number of a thousand, I hate to say it, we'll actually make a dollar off of it. Um, and every penny counts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're in the process, actually, of trying to purchase uh, a building. We, we've rented for 20 years. Um, and we finally got to a place where it's like, we're, we're going to keep this location, probably we'll turn this into more uh, clinical practice focused, our student clinic, and then have our classroom just down on 63rd. Uh, and it's on a half acre of land. So we're going to actually create the same garden we have at home. Uh, Renee and I live on a... Uh, half acre medicinal garden that's uh, United Plant Saver. 
uh, plant conservation garden. Hey, come on in. And uh, we grow about 150 different medicinal plants there. So it's taken me a little over 10 years to create that. Uh, I'll, I'll almost like a uh, uh, double, double canopy jungle there in a way. Uh, we grow a variety of plants from uh, around the world all the way up to uh, the Arctic Circle. We actually have uh, uh, Siberian ginseng growing there, which let's just say it doesn't grow far. Um, so now or never, I, I managed to make it live along a little bit. So um, hopefully that'll happen, and somehow I got to pay the mortgage on that sucker. No. <laughs> so tonight, it's always a, a thank you all for showing up because it's a weird subject. Like, what does it matter? Why would we have certain plants that we only use in the summer? It makes it all year round, and it it's a fun and a little deceptive. No, not that bad. Uh, because when we talk about plants, we don't talk in, we sort of say, you know, I don't expect to burn. Yeah, you're going to do that. But the reality is, we talk about the energetics and how our environment affects us and why we would choose one herb over another. And that's what kind of differentiates somebody who's just Googling it and somebody who's a good herbalist and is going to have more successes. And, and it's funny, like we really hyper-emphasize energetics and diagnostics in herb school, but I think everybody should understand it. And it's funny, I'll spare you all the long story, but I literally started studying herbs when I was 10 years old and I kind of haven't stopped and I'm, I'm older than that now. Um, <laughs> we'll skip the details of that. But I grew up in the Bahamas. I, I, I was, I still remember the bitter melon. It's a vine with the little orange spiky fruit that grows, you know, and it's a weed. Everybody's tearing it out of their house. Uh, in Jamaica, they know that as Um The bitter melon, it's different from the Chinese bitter melon. Stay in front of the camera, Bob. Um, <laughs> the, but I remember the Bahamian woman used to always eat a couple leaves every day. And what they would say is it cools your blood. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. They don't have a, they don't have a fever. Um, and this idea that, especially the summertime, if they ate this, it would cool them off. And if they had blood sugar issues where they were actually feeling on fire, if they had high blood pressure, it would bring it the heat of that down. And so they didn't know anything about energetics. That was the language that they used. And we see that same language through every culture. I was down in um, Ecuador a couple of years ago. I was doing a TV series down there. And I was meeting with some uh, native people there, Quechua people. And it was really nice. It was um, uh, Amu Paquin was this uh, traditional midwives training and actually birthing center. So it was these folks were trying to preserve the ways that they had birthed babies in the jungle for literally thousands of years. And uh, they put on a cool little show for us. It was really nice. And they were they were using traditional gourds over an open fire and making all of these herbal teas that we had picked. And all for the camera, you know, we're staging everything. It looks really cool. And she kept handing me one gourd and then another. And it to me for a drink. I'd say, what's this for? And she'd say, it's for a fever or it's to um, uh, purify. And, and, you know, it was all through translations. I don't speak Quechua or Spanish, unfortunately. And I started asking questions. It was like, there was a lot of them would make you sweat. It's like, why do you want to make people sweat? Like, it's already hot there. You promise, you're sweating funny. And this idea that came up was that disease attacks you through the skin. And I was like, so in Chinese medicine, we use the same language. We say evil travels in the wind and attacks here. Because if it's cold and windy and rainy out, why don't we put your collar up? Why don't you cover your feet? You always cover your head. You cover your neck. Your hands can be out in the open, your arms. No big deal. The same problem. So both these Quechua people who have no internet, have no electricity for that matter, don't know anything about Chinese medicine, and the people across the Pacific Ocean in China 5,000 years ago, they wrote about the same idea that make, make somebody sweat if they catch a cold. And it chases the evil out of their body. What a strange idea. So the idea, and it sounds really cool when I go, climatic impact on health, weather makes you feel different. Some of you feel cold right now. Some of you love the summertime, some of you hate the summertime. Why? 
98.6, right? Everybody's exactly the same. But why? <laughs> so this idea of we would use different herbs in the summertime than we would in the wintertime. Anybody ever wonder, you know, if you, I like to travel. I was a travel writer for a brief period of time. And I particularly like the, the southern side. Why is all this spicy food within five degrees of the equator where it's really hot? Why would anybody want to eat all the spicy food? Think about the Middle East, North Africa, the Caribbean, Central and South America, spicy, Southern uh, Asia, India, spicy, spicy, spicy food. Makes you sweat. How does our body cool off? By sweating. It brings the active evaporation off your skin, cools your body off. Bringing the circulation, eating really hot peppers makes you turn red. That's your blood coming to the surface, making it easier to cool off your body. What would happen if you started sweating every time you ate above the Arctic Circle? You'd die. You'd literally freeze to death, right? So what do they eat? Potato soup, really boring, bland soups and stews. Actually, it's super yummy. But, uh, <laughs> but there you don't find spicy food. And so people traditionally have cooked, ate, made medicine based on where they live, based on the environment. And then they would eat, you know, here it's a little chilly in the winter relative. Um, and it's really hot in the summer and humid. So the foods we eat in the wintertime should ultimately be different from what we eat in the summer. So there should always be change. Um, so in order to understand that, we have to ask, what's the property of food? So if we're looking at, you know, what's our favorite, you know, the, the best thing in the world in the summertime is watermelon, like nothing's better. And it doesn't have to go in your refrigerator. You literally could pull it right out of the field, crack that sucker open, stuff it in your pie hole, and it cools, refreshes, moistens the body, and it's the best thing in the middle of summer. There's nothing anybody wants more than that. If you were up in Alaska, you probably wouldn't be asking for water <laughs> in the middle of the winter. You'd want something warm. And my favorite example, not everybody enjoys ginger as much as I do, but ginger, it's not spicy. It's not cayenne pepper, it's not a jalapeno, but it feels warm in your belly. Stick a, them, a thermometer inside of a watermelon, stick a thermometer inside of a piece of ginger. If they're sitting here on the table, they're the same temperature. We feel different in our body. We experience it different in our body. And we've all got food like that. Lamb is really warming. Venison is super warm. Your potatoes and a lot of your root vegetables are a little bit more neutral and cool. So when we talk about herbs and plants, we think about those the exact same way. That we start to think about, is it hot, is it cold, is it wet, or is it dry? And is it nourishing, or is it reducing? Does it make us lose some of that things that we have excessive? Mm, a couple of chairs up here, do you guys want to camera? Be brutal, come up front. <laughs> you know, and... and I'm gonna stop on that thought for just a second because I did threaten that I was going to rant a little bit. Oh, I gotta find it. Because I know this isn't your drug interaction class, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway. <laughs> so, and I will give you a little bit of my background kind of. So my, my mom was a medical writer. Uh, she's got like 40 medical books uh, that she's published over a lifetime. And um, about eh, mid 70s, she wrote, uh, a lot of you may know Dr. Atkins or heard about it, Dr. Atkins diet and all that. Uh, she wrote a second book with him, The Super Energy Diet. And uh, it was assumed from probably about the time I was 10 or 12 years old that I was going to be a doctor. They didn't know I was going to be a crazy acupuncture physician doctor, but you know, whatever. But it was that shift when she wrote that book, we saw standard American diet switch to, um, you know, we, we rode that health craze in our, our food. It was a dramatic shift for a poor little kid. And that said, we grew up as the Journal of American Medical Association was our bathroom reading in our house. I remember the first pictures of, an electron, uh, of a, uh, a virus on an electron microscope. I was fascinated by everything there was about it. And, and so I followed the Western medicine stuff and, and research and try to study and understand anatomy, physiology, pathology as much as anything. And ultimately, because I do see patients during the day, um, I have to know as much as I can about pharmaceutical drugs, because most people are. I, I mean, 
Nowadays, most 15 year olds are on one or two prescription medications. Most people over the age of 35 have way too many. And I don't want to even talk about how many of the folks in their 60s, 70s, and 80s might be on. I have a few that I'm like, no, sometimes you need medications. They save lives every day. Honestly, they do. Um, but there's a few that I'm not a big fan of. And one of those are acid reflux meds, what we call PPIs. And um, so Medscape is a place that we find new research, medical research. It's very appropriate and usually written for the medical professional. And so today, <clears throat> I've been ranting all day about this. Sorry, you guys are going to have to bear with me for a second. The very top story on like 10 of them is PPIs, just stop worrying. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I, I will tell you, it's a short herb drug, uh, uh, herb drug interaction thing, or actually I should say drug reaction, um, that's for acid reflux, right? The, the assumption is we're producing too much acid, burny, bloaty, pain, uh, esophageal cancer, if you don't treat it and do something about it. Um, and so they reduce the stomach acid, and yay, now you don't have a symptom. Um, the problem is your stomach acid is vital for your survival. It is necessary for you to break down your food. Um, the acid protects you from bacteria, yeast, and fungus, uh, and viruses. It also makes your uh, minerals more absorbable. So things like magnesium, calcium, potassium, um, which are vital for your nerve and muscle function and pretty much everything in your body. And it's necessary, it's a necessary step in the process of getting B12 into your body. So when we reduce dramatically your stomach acid for usually the rest of your life, um, over time, you're gonna have an issue. You're no longer absorbing minerals, you're no longer breaking down your food properly because its job is to reduce stomach acid. And when you come off of it, then you get a hyper, uh, you get a surge or a rebound effect from it. So they basically did a very small um, three-year study. Most of it was, and there's a wonderful commentary at the end, somebody did an analysis of their poor research. And <clears throat> guess who did the research? <laughs> the company that makes PPIs. And um, it was not a well done study where they lot huge things and 80, I wanna say there was 20% of the people dropped out of the study. They didn't bother to find out why. And like, hmm, maybe they're having an adverse effect. But more than anything, the final conclusion was it's safe and totally okay to do it for three years. I'm here to tell you prior to that study, it's the PPIs were invented basically uh, in 1990. There was a single study one year long about the adverse effects of it. It was not a well done study. If you look at the bottle, if you've ever taken any of the over the counter now or prescription ones, um, they always say, don't take it longer than four weeks without consulting your doctor. In the uh, book that they talk about, uh, the, the manual for doctors, when you look up those things, they don't encourage doing it for more than three months, six months to a year. Any kind of and yet most of my patients have been on it for years. Um, and so, um, so, sorry, bad research. And that's gonna be the headline in a lot of newspapers. Like, nope, totally safe. And I'm here to tell you, um, you should question your doctor and say, how are you going to fix? And how do you know that it's an excess of acid? Most people, at least 50%, some statistics say higher, especially if you're over the age of 50, most acid reflux is actually low stomach acid. Um, I almost guarantee it. <laughs> uh, the problem is all of our secretions, all of our hormones decrease as we age. And so why is it that magically the ones in your stomach don't? that they become hyper. Um, and most doctors have never tested anybody's stomach acid. Occasionally they do, but rarely. So I would encourage you, have it tested before you go on meds for life that will greatly reduce your nutrient absorption. Sorry, it has nothing to do with summertime herbs. <laughs> <laughs> I hate bad research. <laughs> and, and I hate to say it, there, there's bad research in the medical industry. There's bad research in the herbal industry, just, just as bad. Um, there's very little research being done in the herbal industry because it's hard to make a buck at it. So when we talk about summertime stuff, usually what we're talking about is acute injuries, um, bug bites, sunburns, sprains, strains, uh, 
We get stung by things in the water, things on the land, things in the dirt. Uh, we tend to play a little bit more. We play less here than we do up north, but we still play out here um, a lot. And so most of the herbs we talk about are more for acute issues. But the other end of it, I like to always talk about when you know, we live in air conditioning, yay. Unfortunately, occasionally a hurricane does tickle our coastline here. And was it last? No, it was two years ago that we got smacked pretty hard. Um, we lost power at home for 10 days. Um, that's no AC for 10 days. And then we get a little warm around that time. Uh, it means no stove for 10 days, no refrigeration for 10 days. Um, luckily, I have a little camping stove and I have some other things I was able to use. So how can we use herbs or food to help us survive the 95 and, you know, degree heat with the 400% humidity? And so I think I want to kind of start with that a little bit. And... I'm going to have a little bit of fun here. And uh, this is a hibiscus. Uh, this is actually, anybody from Jamaica or from Jamaica? No? Yes, from Jamaica. So, sorrel tea. Yeah, so it's hibiscus, right? And it's a sour hibiscus. So we've got, you know, I'll just, you already know what that is. <laughs> Tear off a little piece of it. This is just, uh, it's not exactly the same as the hibiscus that you got in the front of your condo, but it is in the same genus. Isn't it? It's the best thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. yeah. I don't have any leaves left, so y'all may have to share a little bit. <laughs> so hibiscus is in the mallow family. <laughs> So this is um, this is specifically grows in the Caribbean, um, famous in Jamaica, um, and it, I, I don't know that it's the national drink in Jamaica, but it might as well be. <laughs> well, probably rum is, but <laughs> so this is in the mallow family. We talk about mallows. Y'all don't know it, but you know more um, uh, more botany than you know. Everybody probably has an opinion about okra, right? It's not fast, right? It's best deep fried, no. It, it's really slimy, and that's a mallow. So that's a mallow. Um, marsh mallow, way back when, that's where marshmallows came from. Now they're just garbage. But um, in all of your hibiscus, like literally, if you have a hibiscus in front of your house, if you have a hibiscus in front of your condo, that is a mallow, malviaceae, and has similar properties to this hibiscus, or I mean to the okra. And if you eat a leaf of it, it'll get not quite as bad as the okra, but it gets a little bit moistening. If you leave it in your mouth, it'll get a little bit cool. This plant, this particular one, there's one like it. This one's unique to the, the sorrel tea, but we have one that grows better. This one's an annual here. We have one that's kind of can be perennial called a uh, cranberry hibiscus. Another mallow, another hibiscus, pretty flower, just like this one. And that one has that sour flavor like it. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that and sorrel. Um, and it will moisten and cool, but it has that wonderful sour flavor that if you leave it in your mouth, will actually produce more moisture in your mouth. And so all summer long, our lungs aren't all winter long too. Uh, <laughs> you can drink hibiscus as a tea, and whether it's that, you know, that red hibiscus, this one, this actually produces your red zinger. If you ever get some of those, uh, those teas, so, you know, celestial seeds, it means, or whatever it is. Um, the cranberry hibiscus, the sorrel tea, but even the ones that are just regular hibiscus that you grow in front of your house, they won't be sour, but they will be cooling and moistening. And I would say anything in the Mao family will do that uh, in varying degrees. There's other ones around here that do that, but those are the easy ones. Um, one of my other ones that's a favorite. Um... Oh, actually, you know what? Let me talk a little bit more about the, the, uh, the hibiscus. So, Hibiscus is famous Caribbean medicine. You don't see a lot of use of hibiscus outside of the Caribbean. Um, 
it's known to be specific for the circulatory system and for a weak heart. Think congestive heart failure. Um, people who have easy bruising, not from Coumadin or some other blood thinner, but literally like I, I know folks in their 20s, they're usually a little anemic, they're usually fatigued, uh, have anxiety sometimes, sometimes have really lousy um, sleep where they wake up every time the cat walks by. Any of the hibiscus, but specifically either the sorrel or the cranberry hibiscus, all parts of the plant are edible and all can be used literally to strengthen the heart and strengthen the circulatory system. And, and now I'm going to do something that I yell at everybody to not do is reductionism. But we talk about a specific chemical within a plant. Plants are magic. I'm here to tell you that it's about the whole plant, not a special chemical that we pull out. All of your hibiscus are high in vitamin C. So when we see capillary fragility, easy bruising, like every time you brush your teeth, you spit out a mouthful of blood because your gums, every time they get a little bit irritated, that means you probably have really you know, easy bruising, um, weak capillaries, frequently caused by low vitamin C. Instead of eating an orange, which is mostly sugar, more hibiscus tea. That will actually do a better job. And not as dramatic an impact on your digestion uh, as a vitamin C capsule. Vitamin C as a capsule causes diarrhea, stomach pain, because um, it's really acidic and it can irritate the bowels as it goes through, especially at higher dosage. So this won't, this is just lovely. <laughs> All right. So a great combo with that is lemongrass. If you're a gardener down here, I should say if you're not a gardener down here because you have a brown thumb, um, one of the easiest things to grow is lemongrass because if you touch it, you'll kill it. Just throw it in the dirt, as far away from any watering in full sun with crappy soil, and you can grow lemongrass. You start watering it and caring for it, mulching, it's gonna die. <laughs> uh, and it's really nice when it goes into flower and it spreads its seeds, let them go, because then when you mow your lawn, if you happen to do that, you have little sprouts of lemongrass, it's the sweetest smell you ever smell, because you get the mow fresh mowing lawn with little sparks of this lemony scent, it's amazing. The lemongrass, very resinous. We can cook with it, um, or we can make tea out of the leaves of it. Uh, I'm too lazy to go in there and slice my fingers up trying to pull the, the stalks out to get the little bit of stuff that you cook with. I'll buy them at the grocery store. But the leaves I love making, and specifically in the summertime, is the uh, lemongrass leaves. You can use them fresh or dried. It really doesn't make a difference. Fresh. That comes with extra bacteria. People pay big money for. Just eat a, a fresh tomato. That's the best probiotics ever. It's amazing. Um, and honestly, that's the way we used to do it. 100 years ago, you didn't see anybody selling probiotics, did they? No, you pulled a carrot out of your garden, knocked the dirt off, and you ate it. You just got probiotics. You know the most expensive, like we have probiotics out there on the shelf. You know the most expensive ones? Soil bacteria. That'll cost you $50 for a month's supply. Or you could eat a carrot. <laughs> that you grew. Not that I grew. <laughs> so... When we look at lemongrass, it's slightly cooling. It's not dramatic. It's not as dramatic as okra and watermelon. Um, it's mildly diuretic. It makes you pee. Not that you're going to be getting up 50 times at night. Um, it helps to clear out your urinary tract system. Um, it's very resinous. And I'm going to talk about, like, I have this little trio of, of combination that I love from the summertime. And sorry, I didn't make it. I had to do two other things before I did this one. Um, we see a lot of urinary tract infections and yeast infections, particularly in the summertime in Florida. Uh, and I hate to say it, folks move down here from up north and they don't, it's, it's hotter up north right now than it is here, but it cools off at night. And down here, it's, it's hot for a long time. Our summers are long. So too often people walk around in wet bathing suits all day or they um, have like nylon underwear, which gets really hot and yucky. <laughs> and so they end up with yeast infections their first year down here and urinary tract infections is super common. And just because of the difference of our weather, it's a hot, wet environment. So when we put something that makes you pee a little bit extra in that resiny, that those volatile oils that are in there, that rich lemony scent, that actually has the effect of making bacteria not stick to the walls of the bladder and everything else. So it helps to flush out some of those 
bacteria and yeast and things like that that can be a problem. It can be used for that anytime it's thought to help clean out the urinary tract and, uh, system nicely. And my personal favorite is the hibiscus lemongrass and a weird one, rosemary. I like really strong flavors, so not everybody's going to enjoy the rosemary in there. I think it's amazing. It smells amazing. It's a nice dark color, but it get, the hibiscus turns it red. This gets it kind of a almost dark red, a crimson color. This is very resinous. And so that helps to kill any of the wrong bacteria in the body. Um, any Shakespeare fans? Come on, where's my lit majors? Shakespeare, I forget which uh, thing. Rosemary is for remembering. So... Did you ever walk out in the middle of August, right? Three o'clock in the afternoon, that afternoon shower came, you could drink the air, and you can't even think of your own name when you walk outside. That heavy, oppressive blanket. This clears out all the extra moisture. This cools and nourishes your body, and this creates clarity of mind. Something I don't know about anybody else, but I need that in the summertime when it's hot out there. I've been working in the yard all day. So, wonderful combination. Just for general purposes throughout your summertime and creating your own combination. Hibiscus is a, if you didn't notice, that's a strong flavor. If you eat just a little corner of that, it's like, wow, how'd that come out of a plant, right? So a little bit goes a long way. This is just, think lemonade without the sugar. Um, I like rosemary, it's a strong flavor. If you're not like, I love cooking with rosemary. If you're like, I really don't want to smell, then don't put a lot of that in. Um, but I almost use equal proportions of this and I'll adjust it just on what I feel like doing. Yes. Yeah. And, and again, so this is two days old and I add water to this throughout the day. Imagine what this looked like when I made it. <laughs> I like strong flavors. So I, I do apologize. Um, you would not need a lot of that for a pleasant, refreshing tea. I'd make it look like mud and sip on it all day long, no sweetener or anything. And I'm, I'm crazy enough, I actually add a little apple cider vinegar to it because it's not sour enough. For real, I, and our students that are in here, they know, I add water to this constantly. I probably refilled this 15 times. It's that diluted and I didn't make it this morning. I made it yesterday morning, I didn't have time. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> I probably forgot to make it that week. Um, I'm gonna come back to the top. Man, now let's talk about the topicals actually. Topicals are cool. Um, and we've probably, at some point you've all used um, aloe for sunburn, for any kind of burn for that matter. It doesn't have to be sunburn, but it's certainly a classic. And without a doubt, it is phenomenal medicine uh, for a burn. Generally, if you have a third degree burn where you've charred the flesh and damaged tissue down deep, go to the hospital. <laughs> uh, first degree burn, little sunburn, perfect. Um, second degree burn, we start to see blistering. That, that's a, a personal choice on that one. I will say aloe is appropriate for first and second degree burns, and it provides a protective layer. Um, sorry, Claire. And I will encourage you. Ooh, actually, that one's perfect. Oh, yeah. So in case you can't tell, that's gross here. Um, <laughs> if you've never played with that, put a little bit on your arm. And, <laughs> you could, uh, it's okay to let it dry on there, and you'll notice something if you let it dry. Don't worry about the stain. You have some on it, yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants to walk around with snot, right? Oh, there you go. I never thought about using it as air conditioner. That's oh, a, yeah. That's a great idea. Almost like a job. Yeah, like yeah. I will use it. I will use it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just learned something new. Wonderful idea. So, I will say there's very conflicting reports about aloe internally. And the. What I always say is don't use the green part. You want the, the filet. You want to take out the, the slime in the inside and you can get like 
These are small, by the way. You go to the grocery store, they're this big. Those are crazy awesome. If you happen to hit the green in there, it will go from a very honestly neutral, no flavor at all, but what's called a refrigerant. It's considered ice cold. Not cool, but icy cold. Um, and you can actually feel the cold on your skin if you put a little slather on there. Um, opinions vary. I've learned, and I've seen it this way, it's great for an inflamed gastrointestinal system, your gut. Um, but in the same way it creates this slimy protective coating, it will block the absorption of some nutrients and medications. So if you're going to eat or drink this, have at it. Nothing wrong with it. It is wonderful for that. Very, like if you tend towards constipation, burning, inflamed, you know, it's, I always call it the big old tube, but the big tube from here to here, right? It's a hollow spot, right? Your body, 22 feet long or so. Um, that, that's fine, but separate it from your prescription medications in particular. So like middle of the day, you're like, uh, fine, do a shot of this. I'm, I'm okay with it, but don't, don't wash uh, your, your heart meds and your blood pressure or your uh, blood sugar meds down with this because you may not get the full action of it. It will block some of that absorption of stuff. There's some other uses for it as well. I personally almost exclusively use it topically. I think it's amazing for that. But there's a couple of other topicals for burns that nobody actually knows about. And you're more likely, although I think everybody flirts in a room, you can stick it in full sun. Don't even worry about watering it. Water will appear. Um, and it will grow like gangbusters. Uh, and people usually give away little pups that will pop a little thing off the side of here. And so you should grow it. Um, it's good emergency medicine. When I was, uh, it, I was a writer, I said that. So we had a weird life. She would get an advance once a year for like $20,000. I had a lot of money back in the 70s. Uh, and then she wouldn't get paid for six months to a year. And, and so until we got the book finished and she got another little perk out of the deal. Um, so once a year, we usually went on some really cool vacation. It was usually the Caribbean. And uh, might have been eight years old. We went to the Cayman Islands. And then it was back when the Caymans had one bank instead of all bank, <laughs> no people. And I remember distinctly, and I, I, I still fish this way. I had a little hand line. I'm laying on the dock and white boy from New York, right? I, I, my back hadn't seen sunlight in a long time. So I'm there with my swim shorts and I'm just trying to catch these fish right by the dock piling for the entire day. And of course, I didn't like sunscreen then either. And so all of that sunlight reflected and literally I looked like the mummy. My face was cracked, bleeding. My back was blistered beyond anything. And it wasn't until like sunset that I was like, oh, I'm in pain. Yeah. And we tried aloe. Aloe didn't do a whole lot. Um, and so somebody there on one of the staff said, you need to and so literally went uh, and got all of the Lipton tea bags and made a strong tea in the bathtub with cool water and put me in it and then stabbed the tea bags all over me. The tannins in that, that's what makes your tea black and kind of tart, actually was the most amazing thing I'd ever done. It pulled the heat out of the skin. It literally pulled the burnout. And so to this day for red inflamed stuff, works wonderful literally black tea and y'all everybody's got access to black tea you know every grocery store every 7-eleven it's in your cabinet it's in the hotel room there's black tea so it's a super super easy thing and if you're a cheapskate and don't want to waste your perfectly good tea oak will work the same way oak leaves eh, or tea leaves that's actually so oak is used for a hot gastrointestinal system um usually like Day two or three after Montezuma, Montezuma's Revenge, where you got watery, burny stools, but not explosive. Drinking oak. Uh, it's In the books, it's called white oak inner bark. Whatever. Get some oak leaves off of a live oak out front. I don't care. I actually have people come in here and say, have you got oak? I was like, yeah, there's a tree right there. Go get some. <laughs> it's free. The price is right. I promise it works just the same. Um, nobody believes me. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Apple cider vinegar. Vinegar is amazing. It does work. If you have any broken skin, you will scream. And you will scream a lot. 
It is acetic acid, putting acid inside of a open wound hurts and burns and burns a lot. But apple cider vinegar is amazing for jellyfish things. It is one of the best treatments out there and can be used for other things occasionally. Things like a yeast thing that sometimes work. Um, but it's usually the first or second thing I'll try for any venomous things, but specific for jellyfish. The other option is pee on your friend or yourself. Mm -hmm. That works really well. It's a different acid. It's uric acid instead of acetic acid. I'm going with the vinegar. <laughs> it, it's it's a little, you know, less chummy, but um, nonetheless. <laughs> I generally don't like to use alcohol. Um, all of our over-the-counter stuff, stuff from the, the box stores, and have alcohol. Most of your skin uh, moisturizers and everything else have alcohol in them. Alcohol's drying. It will dry out your skin and make you need more oil. And so when your skin's damaged, you don't want to dry it out. So I try to stay away from alcohol. Um, I find it's the it gives very short-term relief. Um, alcohol evaporates at a, a lower temperature than water. So if you dab alcohol on, right? We've all been to the doctor and got a shot or so. They dab a little alcohol on there. Your arm turns cool because it evaporates very quickly. Um, and so it's nice for some short-term relief from a mild burn. Um, but it over time, it tends to damage the skin. I don't recommend oils on burns. Um, that's like deep fried your arm. So yeah, I know that's what my mama used to do was to stick a stick of butter on there. But yeah, you know, that it's great in a stir fry. Don't do it on your skin. <laughs> so I, I that, there are weird exceptions to that, and nah, I just skip it. I I don't do that. Oh heck yeah, we used to do that. Come on, that was standard care. <laughs> Wait, no, no, it, it's it's a scary thing. Yes. Oh. That's really funny. It's vinegar. So, pickle juice, yes, but mustard, no. There's actually a lot of vinegar and mustard, but the mustard itself would blister the skin if it was any good. <laughs> Most of it's just yellow, crappy mustard. Um, I wouldn't, but, you know, hey. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just go for the vinegar or something, and, or an ice cube would be lovely. <laughs> Some cool water would be nice. Um, you know, ultimately, it's funny when we, we take our students, we torture them, uh, both the Western and the Chinese students. They, they all have to go camping. And for a lot of folks, they're like, I don't do that. And they're like, no, that's part of the program. And we limit, we go make them go from noon to noon. And um, one of the things we always like to do is talk a little bit about first aid and stuff because, you know, we've got an open fire, we're cooking, we're doing all this crazy stuff out there. We do weird stuff out there. It's really fun. Making eggs in a paper bag, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For real, it's a thing. <laughs> but what do you do when you're out there? Maybe you don't have ice. Maybe you don't have all these cool herbs. And so mud. Um, of course, nobody ever smokes. Tobacco is amazing for bug bites. Um, I, hey, I used to smoke a million years ago. Um, and uh, But even when I stopped smoking, I always carried tobacco. It is my go-to for uh, spider bites, uh, stings. It almost immediately takes it away. And so you don't have to be a smoker, but you know you can make friends sometimes out in the woods with tobacco. <laughs> and, and I would say for those of you who are a little bit more spiritually minded, if you're harvesting plants, tobacco is the classic uh, offering that we need to plants. Um, so it is good to have that just in case you do need to harvest some plant medicine out there. And, it's funny, David Winston, uh, a, a Cherokee medicine, uh, teaches Cherokee everything, but also a Chinese herbalist uh, and a Western herbalist. And it, it's The running joke is it's my herbalist man crush. Um, but <laughs> I, he, he was talking about the ceremony and, and leaving offerings for plants when you harvest medicine. And, and because th this is a living entity, isn't it? It's, it's alive. It, it, it has a different way of existing than we do. But ultimately, you don't want it. It's going to die. Right, so it needs nutrients. It breathes. It actually gives us oxygen. Like without plants, we die. So it's an important thing. And as we find out, either through the plant singing machine, but they uh, they protect their young. Uh, 
for real, that's not even crazy world. That that's really good research. They will shunt their nutrients to their babies that grow around a tree, um, and and will do without nutrients. Um, they work as a group differently from us. They send out chemical warnings to other plants when bu when bugs are eating them. They'll warn the other plants so that they actually put up their defenses. So a lot of things that we associate with a sentient being, plants do. So they just go yank. Like, well, I wouldn't like this. Like, yeah, right? I'm going to get upset. So we should ask for permission. And there's longer stories with all of that. But somebody's like, well, can I leave a dollar? What the hell is a plant going to do with a dollar? <laughs> oh, yes. That is a great uh, what plants talk about. So, you know, we think about tobacco. It's like, oh, it's an offering. And we burn it. La, la, la. It's actually antifungal and an insect repellent. And so imagine, like I just wounded this plant, its blood, its sap is coming out. And so this is where bacteria, fungus, insects may come after this. So if I were to leave tobacco there, A, it breaks down, it's very nutrient dense. Uh, it's a heavy feeder. It's going to fertilize the plant as it breaks down. And the odors and Real tobacco, not Marlboro's, but real tobacco that you pull off a plant is so pungent, such a strong uh, volatile oils are coming off there. It's sticky and resinous. Will actually help protect the plant from the damage that we've caused. So tobacco uh, sage is a similar type of property, both, both garden sage and the desert sage. So things that are resinous that protect a plant, not just from the spiritual, but from the physical sense is oftentimes what we leave as offerings for plants. Well, I'm not going to get through any of these, are I? <laughs> <laughs> um, I am going to skip down a few just because I have no idea what time it is. Oh, God, look at that. I've already managed to go through 45 minutes. Um, beauty berry. So you may or may not have this plant in your yard. Beauty berry. And this one doesn't have um, any fruit or flowers on it yet. But... Grab a leaf or just um, give it a rub. Oops, not going to be This is a um, large rubbery in your yard. Um, this is an insect repellent. So this thing will be 15 feet high at its max. Uh, almost a whitish pink flowers along the stem. So it's an interesting arrangement. The flowers. And then you'll get these kind of light purple berries and clumps around there. You can eat the berries. They're just yummy. Um, I like them. There's a lot of people who say, oh, you can make jam out of it. You can put poop in a jar, add enough sugar, <laughs> you, you'll like it. So, like, whatever. Yeah, you make jam out of it. Um, I, I think the color purple is kind of cool color. And so to drop a few berries into a salad or onto your plate, just create, you know, we eat with our eyes as much as we do with our mouth and our nose. And so adding unique colors to the plate is just a beautiful thing to do. Um, so these leaves, uh, great reason. It's oddly the University of Mississippi does voluminous amounts of herbal research. I don't know why that particular university has become the hotbed of, of clinical research. Uh, but this plant, the leaves, they pulled the volatile oils out of there and it's tested to be more effective than DEET. DEET is the neurotoxin that's in off and a lot of the other things. And, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a desert storm vet and I had whatever desert storm syndrome was. And so I, re I react really badly to um, chemicals. I have chemical sensitivities, particularly to petroleum based chemicals, not a big fan. Uh, and DEET literally makes me crazy. Uh, so I will not put DEET if I see somebody spraying any kind of commercial insect repellent, I literally run up with. I don't want that stuff anywhere near me. It does cause neurological damage on the healthy people too. Um, and I'm sure all of us at some point had our parents spray us down with a neurotoxin, whatever, they were trying to calm us down. <laughs> so this leaf will work, just rubbing it on your skin. The problem is it's not a highly refined concentrated product, so you don't sweat at all. So you have to reapply about every 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how active you are. Um, I have, I don't know, a dozen of these growing in the yard. <laughs> Every time we do an herb walk or a class at the house, we're just handing out, you know, at this point, our students all know to grab one. Um, 
it also, you know, if Renee was here, we always have this running joke that she first learned it as redneck toilet paper. Because uh, those leaves will get like, you know, pretty good size. And, and I hate to say it, rubbing your drawers out in the woods, especially at night, you don't want the bugs biting you where the sun don't shine. So imagine if you have the insect repellent right where you need it. Um, so it's really effective. The plant itself is used for coughs. So all, plant, all parts of the plant are used for a cough. The leaves, stems, and roots tend to be better for a wet cough and the berries for a dry cough. That kind of holds true. You can feel it's almost sandpapery. It's, it's not, a, it's not a aloe, right? It's really dry in its nature. Um, I haven't yet, and I have the equipment to make it, to make a hydrosol or an, uh, essential oil out of it. You can extract it out there, uh, out of it, and then put that into some sort of insect spray. Um, just haven't gotten around to it. It's on my list. Um, if you don't have this growing in your yard, it's really easy to grow. You, all of the parks have it. If a uh, branch were to accidentally fall off into your pocket um, and you <laughs> stuck it into the dirt or into a pot, it would grow. Or if some of the berries magically fell into your pocket or a bird uh, flew over and pooped it into your yard, it will grow. Um, I would encourage it. It's great to have insect repellent literally growing in your yard. Um, Is it the same as citronella? Like, do you have to put it on? Way better. Way better than citronella. Yeah, yeah citronella. Have it planted around your house, and it'll still. It'll help. Here. I mean, you got to rub it to really get the to get, get those all boilers mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and no particular. I, I know I'm skipping a few just because I'm like I want to hit the really important ones. Um, if you've ever been to a class with me, you've heard me talk endlessly about uh, Biden's. Uh, Spanish needles. Oops. So this is uh, 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 Spanish needles. Uh, and if you've ever, okay, Kendall picked these little ones like oh, so they're all dried out. But I'm not sure you're going to recognize these. Um, so you've all seen this. If you ever walked out of your yard and there was these randy looking daisy like flowers out there, it was that. If you came back in, you had these little two pronged sticky things in your pant leg and your socks. It's the seed from it. A, this is food. Wait, and anybody studying Chinese medicine? No, yeah, yeah, I know it's French. Thank you, there we go. That's the Chinese name. That's all I know. Uh, uh, nope, sorry. X to A. Not bad. Um, it's food first. Like, eat it up young. You can eat it uh, as a salad. You can cook it up like spinach. Throw in a stir fry stew. It doesn't matter. In southern China, where it grows wild just like it does here, they make a summertime tea out of it. Why? To cool off. So we know that it's cooling. It is super effective topically, in particular for bug bites, anything red and swollen. And it's funny, we, um, every once in a while, I think every year, it, it ends up being about a year, you know, they invite us every year. There's a pharmacy school down in Bradenton, uh, uh, LECOM. Uh, it's part of med school, and they got a pharmacy school down there, a PhD program. And for whatever reason, they invite us over to, to talk to their groups down there. And this one group, I think it was the first time we were down there. They're so excited. We brought all these weird plants. We're like, this is where your drugs come from. <laughs> and they're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And, and so they were like, can you show us those in the wild? And so we scheduled the second trip for them. And I don't know that area very well. So I was like, just tell us. Any park will find some medicine. And say so it was summer. It was like this time of year. And they found a mangrove swamp to take us out in. And, and these were the sweetest people in the world. But let's just say, I'm going to guess pharmacy school is not easy. Um, and these folks ain't seen daylight in a long time, much less a mangrove swamp where the mosquitoes are big enough to sow. And we're out there. And there was very little beauty berry. And they didn't want to rub it on their skin because they were delicate. No. <laughs> um, but there was. Two or three of the people there that were the mosquito bit them. It wasn't, oh, I got a little spot. It was a wealth. It looked like somebody hit him with a golf ball. 
and it was painful, red and swollen. And we had just literally said, hey, if you just mash up and make like a little spit poultice, and you slap that Spanish needles on there, it'll help and take it away. So she, we, we handed it a little bit. She puts it over it, and it actually only covered half of the, the swollen up bug bite on there. We sat there. We talked for a few minutes about the Bidens. And one, two minutes went by. We're like, what's it look like? And she pulled it off. One half was still swollen. Wherever the Bidens was, it was normal colored and no swelling. Is that effective that fast? So it's magical. But my favorite is, and it is probably other than uh, it's specific to the respiratory system. Think lungs, think sinus, uh, chronic sinusitis, anything like that. But my specific indication for this plant is a lingering cough after a cold and flu. When you have clear and white phlegm, a teaspoon to a tablespoon of the leaves, two that fresh, 80% of the times it will resolve it in a single dose and it doesn't come back. 10, 15 minutes pop. So imagine that, no steroids, no antibiotics, no inhaler, chew up a weed that's in your backyard, free as can be, 10 minutes, it goes away. <laughs> yeah, but we make money that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, my, my standard of, of proper uh, medicine harvesting, always harvest higher than a dog's leg. I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's talk about calendula. Calendula sounds really cool. Um, Marigold. So Marigold has a range of different benefits. Um, it is an insect repellent that can be thrown around plants. So companion planting, if you plant marigolds in your garden, especially around those things that like tomatoes, it will help to keep away pests. We can use that for any skin condition. Um, it pairs really well um, with plantain, not the banana. This is the weed, plantago. It's a weed that grows all over. It's promised it's in your yard somewhere. Um, if you if you lived up north, you knew this. It looks different down here. We have a different species that grows here in Florida. It works exactly the same. But the, the calendula, the, those beautiful orange flowers in the back are the leaves are okay. Um, topically, in salves, as a poultice, it will heal any abrasion. It's good for bruises, sprains, and strains. Internally, it will help heal things as well. And it's specific for a great point and can fix it in the weekend. By itself, although I do like it paired with plantain as a single, I never use single. As a single, it, I'm going to say it has 70 percent success rate with open and that's insane. You know, or you could go in and immunosuppress and some steroids the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I won't even bother to read off a laundry list of side effects that you'll get from that crap. Um, hey, Liz. Oh. <laughs> um, cat. Ooh, let's talk about catnip. Um, so catnip is a mint, Laminaceae. It is, I'm sorry, I'm gonna throw a fancy words to you, carminative, helps your digestion. Um, bloating, gas, things like that. As insect repellent goes, it is an excellent choice, except when there are pumas and mountain lions around. Which are felines, and if you have ever shared catnip with your kitty cat and watched the response, a mountain lion will do the same damn thing on your face. <laughs> so I don't recommend catnip as an insect repellent unless you're in New York City. You're probably okay. Um, no, it's, it, is a, it is a wonderful tea, and it's interesting. It, if you ever have the opportunity to taunt your cat with yeah, no. um, it, it's, I don't know whether it's crack, meth, I don't know, it's something to cats. <laughs> it, it, is, it is an abuse drug. Um, they, they get high off of it. They literally would spaz out, run in circles, and then they kind of fall on it, and they're just like, <laughs> and, and they're just all blissed out. 
And that's just, you should do that to your animals. They should all be blissed out all the time because they are loving, kind things. They are, they are family members. But unfortunately, they like going to the doctor even less than we do. So if you need to get your cat in the cat carrier and you know that you thought vet and they went and hid from the furthest place in your house, throw some catnip in the cat carrier. That little booger will go right in there and you slam the door behind them. And then when right as you're walking into the vet's office, give them a pinch more so that by the time the vet needs to put them up on the table, they're like, whatever, man. <laughs> weeds for cats so um but most of all i don't know about anybody else it may, maybe it's more up north but we do it here too you know i found out we do barbecues with packs well with us um and barbecues are not the finest food some the finest tasting but maybe not the healthiest and kindest to our digestion so catnip tea um is a wonderful digestive pre and post the bloating gas and all the other fun things that come with that and I'll, I'll put a less fun thing in there. It is my uh, go-to both for um, first trimester uh, nausea for pregnant women, but for chemotherapy. The vomiting and nausea, if for whatever reason you can't access cannabis for that, um, catnip is more socially acceptable. Um, it is generally considered safe in tea. Ask your oncologist whether or not you can have a, a cup of mint tea uh, throughout your day. They've all said yes. Catnip is a type of mint tea. So generally really stylish and great for that nausea. Chrysanthemum. So chrysanthemum, it's a Chinese herb uh, called Zhu Hua. Um, it's not the same when you buy the fly bouquet in public, but you can buy chrysanthemum and use that true chrysanthemum. Um, dried, you can get it. We have it here. The finer tea shops will actually serve chrysanthemum tea uh, in the restaurants. Uh, it is a great after dinner tea. It's specifically cooling. It is used for mild hypertension and is soothing to the eyes. So for red, itchy eyes, I always say make chrysanthemum tea and it's no caffeine in it. So you know, don't worry about drinking it at night or anything. It's totally okay. Get some hot water, throw some a couple of flower uh, petal or a couple of flower um, buds on there. Make some strong tea. Once the water cools off, take them, put them on your eyes, drink a little tea. It's always about drinking a little tea. Then if you're still hungry, eat the flowers drink a little bit more tea. It actually is a lovely taste. It's very mild, it's not bitter, and it will take the redness out um, and not stimulating no caffeine, um, but specific for the, for the eyes. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm gonna go back to marigolds for a second. So some of you will have no idea what I'm saying, so I apologize in advance. Um, if you've ever uh, done research about herbs that are good for the eyes or supplements that's good for the eyes, macular degeneration, glaucoma, you name it, you'll always see in all the eye formulas, lutein and zeanthine. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever notice where the source of that unique chemical was? Chrysanthemum, or excuse me, um, uh, marigolds. Yeah, it comes from calendula. And so calendula has lutein and zeanthine and is good for eye health as well as digestive health. Useless trivial facts by Bob. Um, I'm gonna talk about feverfew just because feverfew is a cool plant. Feverfew is a beautiful plant. <laughs> guess what it's for? <laughs> so guess what, it's cooling. It is bitter. It's not the most bitter plant we have. We have more bitter plants than feverfew, but it is very bitter. The flower is stunning. It's the most delicate, tight, daisy-like flower you've ever seen. It is an aster family. Um, it will reseed itself here. And so I love things where you can just plant it out in your yard. You get these beautiful, uh, tight little daisy flowers in there and you let it go to the seed. And you take them, you throw them around your yard, you get these magic little plants in here. Feverfew um, is used for fevers. Um, it's a considered a refrigerant, super cold. Um, it works about, eh, I'm gonna say 60 to 70% of the time for migraines. It's one of my go-tos. It works best if you pull a nasty little leaf and chew on it. Mm -hmm. 
if you put it, dry it up and put it in a capsule, eh, probably won't work. Um, if you invest in fresh freeze dried or a fresh tincture where they take a fresh plant and put it in alcohol or they preserve it in a specific way, it works okay. Pulling a, a leaf off of it and chewing on it and leaving, savoring the joyous bitterness of it um, usually will walk a migraine back. Um, it, it's, I've literally had an intake where I'm talking to somebody and they're like there for migraines and you see them, they're kind of like squinting their eyes and not being very communicative. I'm like, you got a migraine right now? They're like, eh. so give me a second. I come in and hand them like a leaf or two and a tiny little leaf. I say, chew on this and, and you can cuss me later. Um, and usually within five minutes, the migraine is at least tolerable, if not completely gone. So really good one, but it's got to be fresh. Got to grow your own. Um, lavender. Uh, this is what nobody ever thinks about. So lavender, I know everybody's like into essential oils and all that. I'm, I'm not a big fan of essential oils. As I heard earlier from the skin, you have to wash it with essential oils in the skin. Um, lavender plant, you know, beautiful little blue purpley kind of flowers is specific for burns. Making a tea out of lavender or a poultice where you take the plant, smash it all up and slap it on there. It's phenomenal for any red hot feeling skin. You can drink it. It is disgusting. <laughs> so sweetest smell in the whole world, nastiest flavor you ever ate. Don't eat it. People, I'm going to make some lavender. I made lavender cookies years and years ago. I made these lavender cookies. I was like, oh, but I really love the smell of lavender. And I put like a tablespoon into a little pot. And there was like five flowers in every one. The whole batch out. I rarely throw food out. That shit is right. Yeah, it's no. A half a bud in one yeah. cookie is yeah. strong. So, yeah, be careful with your lavender, but topically phenomenal. Make a strong infusion of tea. You can stick it with your arm in it. You can take a washcloth, dip it in there, put it on any of your burns. It will quickly take the burn out, which means it's cold energetically. Lemon balm. Oh, what shall we say about lemon balm? I love lemon balm. Um, lemon balm is another mint, so it's all of your mints are digestive. Most of them, um, it is a lemon mint with a lo lovely minty lemon flavor. It is relaxing to the stomach, calming to the digestion, floating the gas. Um, it is a very gentle nervine, i.e., it helps with stress. It's not a sedative. Like, I could not go to work and work all day long if I drank chamomile all day long. It's very similar. Chamomile, it's a digestive and it's calming, relaxing, sedative in a lot of cases. It helps me go to sleep sometimes. Lemon balm, I can keep working. It's not going to make you loopy. You can still drive a car. Um, so, that assistant or assistant for stress is great. Um, it's specific for viral disorders in particular herpes. And so all the herpes, oral, genital, and I, I made the mistake, I was, I was still a student and um, I, I, I knew my science. And so somebody came in with what we call shingles, that's herpes. It's a, it's a chicken pox virus, which is in the family of herpes viruses. I know it has a bad word and it, it comes off of one of your nerve roots and causes yucky blistery stuff. The, sorry, it's herpes. It it's, doesn't mean you did anything wrong or bad, but it, it is in that category. So I, I was quickly corrected that they did not have herpes, that they had shingles. Shingles. Um, it's specific for all of those. Uh, it, it can be used topically. It can be used internally. It will also reduce outbreaks. Um, most folks who have uh, oral herpes, for that matter, shingles, trust. The number one reason for outbreaks. And one in four people have herpes, so it's like, why not? Um, the topically mashing it up fresh is phenomenal. It helps to take the burn out. If you ask anybody who has shingles, it burns. It's a nervy, burny feeling. Ask anybody who has herpes, uh, oral or genital, it burns. We need cold things to put on it. Um, it combines topically really well with or lavender for that matter. St. John's one is specific, specific for nerve pain. 
And so applying it topically, I don't encourage anybody to use St. John's wort internally because there's a lot of adverse reactions with it internally with drugs, but topically 100% safe. So really, really good plan. Um, lemon balm, it's, it's funny, the volatile oils to make a spritz spray on it for just like a little bit of sunburn or just like to spray that is just me. Um, and it's relaxing without sedating. Say that about all the mints. Mugwort. Ah. I got to write this one because there's so many variations of this. This is also a Chinese herb by Ye. This is matzo. If you've ever walked into an acupuncture clinic, and you thought they were all smoking uh, marijuana in there? They might have been, actually. Um, <laughs> no, it's usual mugwort, which we burn on top of the needles. Uh, anybody remembers any of the old Steven Seagal movies? He woke up out of the coma for so many years, and he did acupuncture on himself, and he had stuff burning off. That was mugwort, actually. Um, it's a very classical treatment. We, we use it here. I don't think they're smoking weed. Um, so mugwort, internally, you have to be cautious with. It's a great herb but it will invigorate blood and is specific for menstrual issues, in particular, menstrual pain. When a heating pad, I was about to say hot water bottle. Renee makes fun of me because I say ice box and a uh, hot water bottle. Nobody owns those anymore. So I'm actually 400 years old. Um, so, <laughs> so a heating pad, when that makes menstrual cramps better, mugwort is oftentimes indicated for that, but it will increase blood flow. Um, so you, it will start your menses early if you're not careful with it. Um, the act of smelling it or burning it will enhance dreaming. It's actually a visioning herb. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know people smoke it. It's really not a good thing to smoke. Burning, smoking any hot burning leaves is generally considered bad for you. Smoking oak leaves will do bad things to your lungs. So will any other plant. Um, a lot, uh, some native cultures will actually just take the fresh plant, rub it, and literally sleep on top of it, and it will provide the visions on how to heal people. Um, I won't say that I've done that very often. And all of it, this is a plant family artemisia, and they're really a lot of similar shapes where it's got this nice green, just kind of standard things, but the underside is a silvery gray color. They'll get kind of tall and leggy, and so in the breeze, it's like green to silver. It waves at you as you walk by. And feel free to get it on the rub and smell. Uh, this one, it's not native to Florida, but it grows very, very well uh, here in Florida. And has a variety of other uses, in particular, as an insect repellent. Mugwort. It can be added to, like, think about it. We could use any combination to make either uh, vinegar or an infusion if you're Microsols, you can actually take all these herbs together and create a blend of insects. Yeah, basically, no. <laughs> we might come up with something else. Yeah, ultimately, neem. All right. Uh, so. Neem is a in India. Uh, it is a fast growing tree. Uh, it grows really well down here. Um, and it's, it's always funny. Uh, so neem is known as an insect repellent. It's an antifungal. Uh, we'll actually grind it up and, and um, make a strong uh, tea out of it, infusion, and spray it on plants that are being challenged by bugs, like mites right now are just attacking. There's uh, the scale bugs. Um, and with all the heavy rain we've been having, fungus starts to grow on some of the plants that are getting drowned a little bit. Spraying a really strong spray of neem on them will do wonders. Uh, to start, don't use vinegar or alcohol, that will kill your plant. Uh, but you can put a little bit of like a couple of drops of dish soap in there and it will fix the plant. Um, but neem's used topically for fungal stuff. Guess when we get the most fungal stuff? In the summertime, yay! Um, so it can be used topically, internally. It's rough on the gut, it's very bitter. Um, it is. It can be used as an antiparasitic, but if used long term, it does damage. It's a wonderful mouthwash, and it can be used as a toothbrush. Yes. 
it's very cold and it and it's killy so we need like it's parasites is misused the term in in our culture so i i see way too many people doing parasite cleanses good bacteria are a parasite and so you want them we we survive on them it's when the little boogers get out of whack that it's a problem so if you want to kill all those and try to rebuild the billions if not trillions of good bacteria that belong in your gut good for you know go for it but we, we have thousands of different types so doing a probiotic with 14 different strains is great you only got uh 900 uh, 9,000 more different strains you got to find that's a lot of carrot in the ground uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not a fan of killing off all your gut flora um, rebalancing is better so i don't recommend neem internally people do it all the time um, if you do it, don't do it long term, or it's going to be a lot of work to fix the gut. Um, externally, love it. Mouthwash, tooth powder, or is a toothbrush? And I, I, I need an oak stick. So every culture has like oral hygiene's a thing, right? And so yeah, we've got our plastic toothbrush and all of that, and we've got all our fancy toothpaste. And if you're really hardcore, you make your own. The, the reality is what we do before crest. Right before Colgate, so use plants. There's a shocker. So there's two things you could do. You could do a, a mouthwash, right? And so if you went, if you're if you're from the Carolinas, from Georgia, um, they have yellow root there, and you go down by the side of the creek and you pull this thing out, and it's got berberin in there. It's bitter as hell. You can find it in a, you know the old uh, pharmacy. They would have a, a jar of yellow root. You pull it out, and you chew on it. And that was how you cleaned your teeth. And it was phenomenal. Berberin is the thing that makes it yellow. It's in uh, golden seal. It's in Oregon grapefruit. That berberin is a wonderful antimicrobial. It tightens the tissues up and get rid of plaque and all the other yucky stuff. In India, they use neem. I forget what it's, I think it's in Southern India. I forget what they use in Northern India. There's a halu or something like that. I forget which side is which. You know what they used here? Oak. Oak is wonderful for, for it. So you can make a mouth wash, rinse, gargle out of the twigs or the leaves. The tannins in there kill stuff and will tighten up your gums. Or you can actually make a chew stick just like you do with the yellow root and you just chew on it. And the fresh stick, not the dried one. And it works the same way. And I hate to say it, every time I go camp and I forget something, too often it's a toothbrush. You'll see me chewing on an oak stick. Uh, so it works like a champ. Other than yummy, it's not going to be that good for your teeth. <laughs> I know. It, and you can grow cane down here. It, it, it grows okay. It definitely belongs further south. But I won't say it's good for your teeth. Yeah, it's still sugar. And, and it's with fiber, so it's less impactful. But, you know, a little bit sugar cane to burn. <laughs> I love to make some. Um, neem, no, oh, nettles. We got to talk about nettles. I didn't find nettles out there. All my nettles is at home. So, stinging nettles, and, and I know, like, wait, why would I want to get stung? Yeah, right? So, uh, all of our students know this one. So, stinging nettles literally will sting the crap out of you unless you talk nice to it and, and ask permission. So, if, I, if he didn't know me, I walk up to my nettles, he's going to punch me. <laughs> and, and so anybody stranger walks up to you and starts grabbing a hole, you grab you by the hair, right? You're going to get upset. So you walk up to a plant and you start grabbing them by the head, he's going to be upset. Well, stinging nettles has a defense and they have little stinging cells in there and they hurt like hell. Um, so if you grab it, it will sting you. If you walk up and say, hey, I just want to, I just want to say hi, you totally like, this is the pen they sell your hand, this is the pen on your phone. It won't sting you. Um, and it was really funny. We had we we had a one on ones class, and this great student. I, I don't remember whether she continued with all the program or not. But she's like, I want to experience everything in plants. I wanted to know what it feels like to get stung by stinging nettle. Like, you go right ahead. She went, wow, stung the crap out of her. Turned her arm red. She was crying for a half an hour. It was hilarious. No, um, <laughs> why am I teaching you about so stinging nettles? <laughs> And it'll grow inland really well. As you go further north, it's a weed in your yard. People are like, oh, my God, I got sticking it. I'm going to kill it all. 
if you work at it, you can grow it here. Like I have, I think my patch is like a 10 by 10 feet patch of stinging nettles. It's going to seed right now. I'm like super excited. Uh, and it's it's taken me years to figure out how to grow it. And Willow, a lot of you know Willow. She's always at Saturday morning, or less often nowadays, but Saturday morning market, she's got the best plants. They are like, ours are grown without fertilizer and pesticides. Hers are biodynamic, off the charts. You're not even allowed to smoke near her. She will cane you if you smoke near her plants or you try to take a picture. You will not steal the soul of her plants. Um, so her stuff is amazing. So she grows nettles like gangbusters. And what she found was our summer rains will destroy it. And so you have to put it just inside the drip line of an oak tree. The soil's nice and rich, and the branches of the oaks gives it kind of a dappled light, and it keeps those heavy rains from beating the plant into the ground. And I did, I, I don't have a lot of oak trees in my backyard, so I put mine under a moringa tree, and it worked even better, I think. I think the leaves falling off the moringa tree actually created a great fertilizer for it, um, and it was nice dappled light and those it's kind of wispy branches and leaves really broke it up nicely. Um, so I, I personally, I don't have a lot of arthritis. There is some schools of thoughts which will take live nettles plants and clip them and then hit you in your arthritis. Um, and that sounds crazy. I have not tried this. Um, I, I literally have people who wanna buy nettles plants from me um, so that they can do that. And it sounds crazy until you think about anybody ever use a capsaicin cream, cayenne pepper, and you're rubbing it on your stuff. You know why it works? It's so painful, your nerves shut down. For real. That's what capsaicin, it shuts down. There's, there's little blocks in your nerves when your pain is so severe, it will say, oh, no, we're not going to talk about it. So you're burning yourself with a chemical burn of capsaicin until your body goes, oh, hell no. So, so that's great, you know, like you don't hurt anymore. It doesn't fix anything, but it feels, it doesn't feel anything. So that's kind of the idea. It also increases blood flow from the stings because it swells up and it's a little red. It does go away. Um, I don't like doing that. Once you either dry or heat the nettles, the stinging cells are destroyed. It is rich in minerals. It's considered a blood tonic. It is one of my first choices as an antihistamine. It's safe long-term. It tastes, I like it. Um, it does a wonderful job. Like you can just stick some in some hot water. It's lovely. It's a grassy little flavor. The best way is to take like a quart jug and a handful of stinging nettles, throw it in there and put it in your fridge overnight. And it's this thick, gamey thing that kind of smells like a fresh mown lawn, but with a kick. Um, it's not sedative at all. So it's nourishing, it's not stimulating, but you feel focused and energized, ideally. And it, it's funny, here in Florida, it's really hot and humid, right? Especially in our summertime. It's drying. And so it seems to make it feel not so humid. If you live in the desert, if you live on the mountains, you'll crumble up and die. Literally, people in the mountains in the dry era should never drink nettles. Or if you do, only if you have horrible sinus issues. But I'm pretty sure I put nettles in here. I won't swear. I'm pretty sure there's nettles. Um, that usually goes into my swill that I drink every day because um, I have chronic sinusitis. Thanks, Army. Um, so I, we see a lot of um, student clinic. Four nights a week, we have intern clinic here. Our students can be in practice. And um, we don't advertise that we see dogs and cats, mostly dogs because I'm allergic to cats. But, um, <laughs> but we love seeing dogs. The number one issue we see with dogs, especially in the summertime, the fleas. And so many of the dogs are having allergic, they're sitting there, they're itchy, itchy, itchy. And then you end up putting them on steroids and antibiotics and all that. Sometimes it's the food, sometimes, yay, this is Renee. If anybody doesn't know Renee, the other half of the awesomeness. Uh, <laughs> so they need nettles, literally. So we have a hundred plus pound behemoth of a dog, a hundred pounds of love. Um, and every morning we throw a handful of net. We just take it, dry it, throw it into his food bowl. He got, he gets upset if we don't throw nettles in his bowl. And when we don't give him, within a few days, he's scratching. And it's sometimes a sensitivity to the fleas. We give him pretty good food, so it's probably not his food. And you know he's just outside getting bit by mosquitoes and gnats, the same as the rest of us. So he's itchy. As long as we give him the nettles, he's great. He's a super happy dog and has the best coat ever. 
everything. But all, all bug bites and all interactions, reactions that we see in the dog today, that we have to actually, like they're there and we go like this to, means that there's a nice redness to them because that's where your awareness was, was brought to them, which means that you're having a hyper inflammatory response that's been to bug bites and like way it changes the bite system and other medicines. And so in all aspects, all things that vent heat are taken care of with the same metals internally and externally. So when you have inflammation in your body or overhistamine response in your body inside and you can't see it, that's the same thing. So when you're having those little micro, those little micro bites from like something like a flea or a mosquito, that itch that you're feeling is actually a pain response to it. So tiny it registers to look like an itch in heat venting out. That's the reaction that they're hoping to because then there's more blood coming out, then there's more swelling, and it's easier for the to use. But if you translate that over an inflammation thought process or a type or histamine response thought process, it makes it way more pleasant. But it also explains why when you give animals or yourself treatment for something like a dog bite, that it doesn't go away necessarily the next day it comes back, and you're always like, wait a minute, I thought I took care of this, I must have more fleas, there are more mosquitoes. It's not, it's because your body's continuing to vent the heat of the original um, response, like a hyperhistamine response. So this is good for that as well. If this is something that you think about why those things are happening, because sometimes we'll give medication and you're like, this isn't working. Well, it really is, but your body's continuing to try to fight it and make sure nothing's there that's going to cause the response and nothing to do it. So it's a correct response that just got out of whack, considering the stimuli that we're giving to egregious brain and all systems. Um, we talked a little bit about plantain, and so remember, not the banana, the, you know, in your little handout, and some of you probably didn't get the handout, hopefully you got some more, if not, we'll make copies. Um, the, um, the Plantago Major is the herb of commerce that grows up north. There's a few secret uh, patches of it here in, um, St. Pete, around the Tampa Bay area, I ain't telling you where they are. Um, <laughs> they're mine. Uh, <laughs> But we do have, there's two other species that grow here, uh, the narrow leaf plantain and the lancelata we see occasionally. You can use them identically. Plantain can be used internally uh, or externally. I probably use it externally more. Any kind of uh, sprains, strains, uh, scratches, cuts. Um, I've even used it for non-healing wounds. And don't try this one at home, kids. Uh, I've had, I've powdered up primarily plantain. I'll sometimes add other herbs to it as well. Um, and sent that to wound care clinics with people. And for wounds that hadn't healed in two years, we're actually getting worse and deeper where like you could stick your finger in it. Um, that within a, a few months it's healed up. And so plantain is amazing, amazing medicine, but any kind of acute, uh, injury, for chronic non-healing wounds. But, so like we're talking about, if you kind of like to clean up our outdoors and we're doing a lot of things outside and need anything from, from elders to animals to children to ourselves, and it's number one property besides the wound healing is what's called the drawing effect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And the drawing effect is like when I show people draw from the street that it almost seems like an old time used to say, to say like it used to be that you show up into the private shop and get a drawing set out of that it called the drawing. And it's the pull things to the outside, which is why we can pack it into the room. And it's considered food from a good old like southern standpoint. If you're gonna do um, something like uh, like survival skills in Florida, it's considered food. It's a pot or it's a salad, or you can eat it, which means that you could pack it into a wound on an animal or a child, even a baby, and have them sticking it in their mouth or doing something like that. It'd be completely fine. It's like not a problem at all. But you don't have to worry about anything getting stuck or any infections because it's going to keep pulling stuff out. So it's a good way to get like a reversal on an infection to get um, like think about little kids or not little kids, big kids. Because, you know, if you think about skateboarders in the middle toys of summer, kids? no, not toys or rest kids, like skateboarders in high school, even, you know, they're out all summer. They can stay out late. They're sweaty. They're gross. Teenage boys tend to have staph infections and they do like a home plate slide off their board. That they're going to have gravel and stuff in their scrapes. They're not going to go home and wash it. And it's going to even start to clump up and clot before they get home, finally get in the shower that night, next day, go back out, start it all over again. So they've got sand and glass and germs all in there. 
if it starts to get infected or it doesn't heal up, it's okay to put that over something that's already starting to close up because it's going to pop something out of there. I've had something come out that's been in for 15 years, a piece of cement. Yeah, totally. No, not even as a, as a second, as a, I like, Hey, let's try this because it had, it was up in here and it had moved down onto the elbow and it's somebody who primarily did computer work. And so their elbows were on their desk and it was moving around like a little knot. It was disgusting. Yeah. And I was like, all right, come here, let me see. And, and we just goobered it on up and took a couple of days to do it. And that thing finally popped out. I had to pump it out eventually, but it did. It was this little chunk of ceramic and cement. So it was interesting. Like I was like, okay, all these things we we you know tell people actually work. But that's why it's okay to shove it into cuts or to put it into the failure to heal. So you can think across the board what that looks like. Like that's that's a yes. Like that should be in your medicine cabinet. It can go on everything. Anyone can have it. So many really sick special populations, it's food. So it's something that's not a danger in any way, shape, or form. And in fact, we eat it to draw things out that are infected or just because it's good food, like it's good for you. Yes. Well, let's qualify that. That's true. Okay, yeah, there, so, is, there is some different ones. So there's several well. sand nettles and things that if you grew up in Florida, like your grandma would have told about sand nettles because it's big, good as a nettle. Yeah. That's not it. It's like little white flowers. Yeah, those are that you feel yeah, like you've been those stung Those are flowers, like, like jellyfish, which is a permanent uh, type of tree. That's not it. It has to be the ergopomerates, the urtica. But we can get it to grow here. And when it takes off and it's happy, it's good to go, and we learned from Will Lamont, yeah, who's a that dear friend, about do, draw, doing it on the tree line, any tree line that's on a Miranda line right now, not an oak. And yeah. so once it goes, it goes. And in the warm climate, it really does need the protection of that tree. But then it's like, all right, there you go. And I take it and make food. There's several of my students here that have eaten it. Like, I'll make some pesto and make food with it. Throwing it into just some vinegar would be like medicine, period. You could just keep it and be good to go. So it can grow, does grow right now. It looks like a little mini forest in our backyard. So, so good to go. So, and there, the bull nettle is scary. Uh, there's, I've seen a similar species. It's an urtica, but it's not, um, it's not the primary herb of commerce. As far as I know, we can use that one the same. Um, I actually get the herb of commerce seeds and grow them so they grow better. I don't know that it's not ethnobotany style able to be used. We just don't know of it. And it's not the food that nettles it. Like nettles is food, and that's why it's very safe for everybody. And the in the think scrambled eggs. Things like this are so silent when I say this off. Yeah, it's going on my head and stuff. I like it. Yes. Yeah. So cat, cat, cats are more, yeah, cats are more challenging because they're they're still wild animals. Dogs are all domesticated and sweet and cuddly. Cat, cats will eat your throat if they were given the opportunity. Uh, they're cute. So they're, but they're eaten. And so for there to be change around their feeding spot is a terrifying thing and they have very developed sense organs and so forth. So as soon as you change their food or you do something different, they're like, I don't trust you. And, and so you literally you put like a little nettles into a bowl and you start like five feet away. And every day you move it a little closer and then maybe you put like pink one there's, leaf in the food. Yeah, several, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I, I couldn't believe we didn't have any other. It's all at home. I'll bring some tomorrow. Yeah. They have to they have to lick it off. Yeah, they'll get over it. Yeah, they're super fun to work with. Um, 
I want to talk about one more for sure. And then I know like people, I, I always find it funny. It's like a lot of times when we do these, it's like we talk about whatever crazy stuff we're going to talk about for that free lecture, but half the people are here because they want to ask this one question that has nothing to do with it. So I want to give everybody an opportunity to do that too. Um, but I want to talk about Crim Free real fast. And um, oh, I'll pass this one around. I'm going to say, don't eat this one. Uh, but feel free to touch it. This one's really well done. Um, but grows like gangbusters. I probably have 10, 15 plants growing now. They're big, bushy things. Um, there are never pregnant, never to an infant, compromised liver or kidneys. Um, it, it can cause serious internal, or, internal organ issues because of the uh, pilozytic alkaloids accumulate in your body, whatever. Topically, this is magic. So comfrey is 100% Safe to use topically. It's one of its common names is knit bone. Um, so any kind of closed wound injury. So never for puncture wounds, never for deep cuts. And I'll explain that in a second. But sprained ankle, uh, got hit with a softball, uh, hairline fracture, any kind of an acute injury like that. Mash that sucker up and mash and put it on there. The pain that the shift of the pain and the swelling and the speeding of the healing of it is ridiculously fast. Um, the, the, the <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the problem is it will grow tissue very fast. So if you put it on a puncture wound, it will grow. The, there's a chemical in there called allotonin, whatever. Uh, it will cause the surface skin to grow so fast it will trap the bacteria in there and you'll get an infection of anaerobic bacteria. That would be bad. tell one more story about it is it's hard to find online I, I might have actually put it on our face on our youtube page I, I'll, if not I, i'll put it there um we used to we had uh when our shop was downtown uh we brought a functional medicine doc in with us who did iv nutrition um and we, we had a hyperbaric oxygen chamber that i had brought on board I, one of these days i'm gonna get it fixed um but we had somebody who came in um he he was a online race car driver. I still don't understand that, but he really does well at it, makes a living at it. Yeah. And he was doing a fundraiser and they were racing go-karts, uh, uh, go for real go-karts. They were in them. And something happened. He, um, the engine blew up and he, you know, they, and the video is online. Uh, he caught on fire. Um, and as part of that explosion, I, they think the gas cap flew off and hit him in the elbow, shattered his elbow. And he went to the hospital, they put a bunch of pins in his elbow, and um, I think two days, after, <laughs> two days after he had the surgery, he checked, checked himself out of the hospital, refused pain meds. Um, I forget whether he did antibiotics. Second and third degree burns over much of his back and his shoulder. He had three areas of third degree burns, like that was from the doctors. Um, he showed up at our clinic. We are not a burn clinic, please don't call. Uh, <laughs> not for that. He refused the normal Western care and wanted us to help. And he, we had seen him before. Um, so we did uh, long-term uh, mild hyperbaric oxygen. We did IV nutrition. Um, we did acupuncture, specific things for burn care uh, in acupuncture. And we, um, we gave him herbs and we did them. At two weeks, 
post-accident, we thought that he had regained so much use of his arm back um, that the bones had healed. And it's impossible to do that in two weeks. The fastest any fracture, mild fracture can heal is four weeks. Usually six to eight weeks is more normal. And what they had to do is they had to pull the pins out of his arm before the bone actually grew over the pins. So we sent him back to the orthopedic surgeon at two weeks, they refused to see him because it was impossible. At four weeks, the soonest it could have happened, and they saw him, the bone had grown over the pins and he had to wait and raise about $20,000 so he could afford the surgery to break the bone to pull the damn pins out. Comfrey is a powerful ass plant. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's one of the problems. Our medicine's powerful. And the problem is Western medicine doesn't know yet how to work with us. They're getting there. Um, so we get some anomalies every day. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's one very safe to use with closed wounds. It's very safe. Any kind of bumps, bruises, twists and sprains. Heck yeah. Um, for broken bones, go to the doctor, get it set. Then, you know, then it's okay. Let me add one more thing to the conference too, just because I know that a lot of you come to us, not only because we're interested in that, but we're also growing as well. But if you know where your comfrey came from, it's such a, a huge um, catalyst for new for um, nourishing your garden, as well as like a compost, because it draws minerals from the soil so drastically. If you don't know where it came from, it's drawing whatever's in there, like heavy metals and whatnot. So you have to be careful; you don't want to poison your garden. But if you get it from an organic gardening area, um, it would be a wonderful thing to use for composting. Too, like to and root stimulator as well. Yeah, cuttings. Tons of, tons of root stimulator. And you'll have to rotate it around your garden because it will uptake and then get out and then uptake. So it's good to use a crop rotation plan. But if you Google that, it will come right up. Like it's known in the permaculture world as being one of those cover crops that is able to then give back in another way. And it's beautiful. Like it, it bushes out, it has beautiful flowers. You'll want it around. It's just a beautiful thing to have. And it, it works really, really well. The other thing that I use as a mom that I've used it for in the past is when I get these really huge leaves, the leaves can be like this big instead of the ones that you see in the little pot. I'll take them and fold them up and put them into a Ziploc bag and put them in the freezer. So they're perfect to go on top of something like a burn that's clean, it's cold, it's soothing, or onto a wound, kind of like a band-aid that lays over top. So just being able to save them to, to use all the way through the winter time is something that's awesome. Um questions we covered way too much information <laughs> what was that one thing you wanted us to talk about oh come on you're shy no. yes uh, you know i never asked this in class or anything but i make a thing certainly on youtube and it's called the Ziploc bag and it has like um the leaves in it and then it has like the so if fresh, you need to wilt it first and get some of the moisture out, even though it's a fairly dry thing. Um, or if you do it in alcohol and you're using fresh plants, you need a higher proof alcohol because you're, you're diluting. Yeah. And I'm sure that Bob talked about them too. About, oh, and a very, very easy oh, one. I, I, got I, it. We ever, uh, I know, but that's not easy to work with yeah, for a recipe true. for a mouthwash. Yeah. So a very, very easy one would be just a, a plantain because we want to draw out some Celtic sea salt, just a little bit. Okay. And it's specific to Celtic, but you can use any. And then calendula. And Calendula is such a strong antimicrobial and tissue knitter. So both of these are tissue knitters. Both of them are considered to be antimicrobial. One of them draws things out. So you get tooth pain when things are swelling. 
So when you're having abscessing, you're getting, that's when you're getting pain. If you can drain, i.e. the salt, gentle osmosis, if you can drain that to the outside, that it's very, very um, easy to reduce that pain nearly immediately. And this goes to healing it, pulling out the infection, and then knitting those tissues back together with antimicrobial inside. A slight variation to this, if you could stand it, if you were only doing it at night and eventually it would make your teeth really white, is uh, just some, some basic charcoal spelled incorrectly. Yeah. No, it's Pull. not. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Circle. No. Uh, this is you guys are seeing my. Uh, no, that's not how you spell that. This is. Oh. Yeah. That's not how you spell that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is that is it? Yeah. Um, adding charcoal. Adding charcoal to it. What that does is it's going to surround the poison, just like when they give you when you have a drug overdose or a medicine, a baby medicine. They put charcoal into your stomach. That surrounds the poison and neutralizes it and carries it out of your system correctly. So if you really had problems with it, there's a lot of autoimmune that has cracked teeth and abscessing, then it's going to surround that. You wouldn't be afraid, like the dentist gives you one antibiotic when you're doing a deep cleaning because he's afraid of it going to your heart. That will help eliminate that. Yeah. 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 It's a wonderful oh, yeah. toothpaste. Like this is a wonderful toothpaste. And it helps to re-enamelize the teeth. If you Google re-enamelize my teeth, this will come up in portions that you can follow. And you can see a time-lapse difference of the people like where it works. And if they don't have it for a week, what it looks like. But but this is this is for fixing the gums and teeth. Like when it's yeah, and you can add anything to that you want, like mint or thyme or anything that you feel is going to help along the way as the base. I will tell you though, with the with the onset of use of clove essential oils, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual clove. The clove essential oils can kill the nerves. That's how strong it is. Yes, I wouldn't use any. Zero. Zero. No essential oils. I would use the actual plant. So any anything that Bob talked about can be added to that, but because it's the little triad of antimicrobial tissue knitting and drawing out, it's then safe to put anything else in there. Like if you had a crack and you were afraid of something getting stuck, it's not going to, the plantain's gonna pull. And so anything that you would normally have. So if you wanted to add clove, mint, um, orange, whatever you hear about being a good swooshy wash for you, then with that as the base, and it doesn't taste like anything. Like it's not going to mess up a little salt, something good. And then you could leave the salt out if you want, but I promise you it's right. So for anybody that wants more than one of the salt, the salt, I would say, is fine. Mm -hmm. But these were powder. Sure. Yeah. It would actually crazy chance that it can cause. We say that there's a relationship, not your real kidneys, so this cool energetic idea. Your kidneys, your bones, and we say the teeth are an extension of your bones, you're controlled by your kidneys. Um, and so we associate a flavor with every organ. Salt is the organ as a flavor of the kidneys. So the salt is vital to be in there. It, and in front of the things, we say kidney is your essence. And so what happens is our kidneys get weaker as we age, and your teeth don't fall out when you're 22 unless you get punched in the mouth. Your teeth do fall out as you age. And so this is an expression of our aging. Our I want to say more product. about that as well, but I won't want Matt to forget. Yeah. What were you going to say? Not to wrap it. Wrap, uh, so what he was asking was, since we were talking about the salt moving the water, would it be appropriate with edema to wrap it in extra salt? And to me, it's more to extract from like, oh, so what happens is we have a transfer of balance of fluids because of osmosis. And so if you, if you put a heavy amount of salt next to something, it's going to 
transfer the fluid, make it an in, inhospitable microbial area, and move the fluid to a balance. So if you wanted to move that fluid to a balance, it's actually going to reach the outside instead of move through the system. If you ingest it, then it will move out, i.e. adding potassium to something, some kind of diuretic gas. So it's going to move out. We don't want to map it. We want to So we do want the loose bandaging if you want to and it would burn if it was open. Which I don't care. Like, <laughs> it depends on how, like, what I heard out. Yeah, like, that's old-fashioned. Yeah, okay. yeah, So it don't matter. Stop whining. It's getting hurt that bad if you're running from it. And so, yeah, like, so, 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 so it's, it's not fair. But when I talked, you guys did a bio on me about I talked to Rosie Spencer, Florida, for forever. And I used to run a street medicine for many, many, many years. And it, I tell the students all the time when we were doing survival skills, the charcoal, cayenne, and salt, that's all I need. I'll save you. That's all I need in a little Ziploc bag. And we're good. Because that salt bumps into an infected wound in a heartbeat. It'll cure it all up, seal it up, stop the bleeding, and immediately kill anything else in it. Anything. Because you just make it so inhospitable and you cause the, the poison to go in. Not a good time, but it works. <laughs> 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 Mm-hmm. Any other questions, anybody? Go on, go on. Oh, let's go twice. Oh, no, go on. Yeah. So my dog's weird. He's a boxer. Yeah. I mean, it's a issue. Yeah. So often in the yard, I see him chewing on leaves and things like that because it helps him with his teeth. Yeah. So I haven't stopped him because yeah. I can tell that's causing mm-hmm. him to find some relief. Mm-hmm. Are there any of these herbs or yeah. plants that you've mentioned today? That would be good for that, or yeah, maybe yeah. that you haven't mentioned. No, so here I'm sure that Bob's talked about Ceta and Vitans. He did Vitans, but that's okay. So, so he's probably eating Ceta and Vitans. Probably Vitans for sure. Yeah, so. for sure. They're both anti-inflammatory. They're both considered um, antimicrobial, antiviral, and antibiotic. Spanish needle. So it's Spanish needle and what's butcher's broom or witch's broom or you know Ceta. It can be a min- like a million things, and it literally is like lining. I could walk right out and grab some out of the ground and like oh, yeah. hand it to you. The other thing is it's very mucinelogenous, so it's very soft and soothing to the tissue and cooling. So that would be another reason why it'd be okay. And they're both very nutritious. And so that helps with the immune system and helps to balance the waterways. One of them is considered to be balancing for all conditions. So it just regulates what's going on in the body in general. So it's just a yes. And the only other thing is I know... Yeah, but I just say nettles. Nettles in general. Yeah, nettles in general because they're older, for sure. I will eat them like if I put them in a Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and which comes to shop, right? I am you know, scheduled to have him come to the student clinic and we'll kind of poke at him a little bit. Yeah. See what's going very on. Calm. His breath is very bad. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very yeah. Very it's bad. okay. I got really <laughs> disgusting dog legs the other day. Okay. Yeah. Not I, got, really. yeah. I got dogs that all over me yesterday. Old dogs always have bad breath. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's probably what he's eating. And it's the season. The horses will do it too. It's the season for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Else? I thought I saw another hand like back in here. Anybody yeah. want? In that case, I'm yeah. Yeah. sorry. I'm mm-hmm. yeah, Bob, I can ask a question about the Yeah. Would it be better an infusion? An infusion, I mean, tea is an infusion. Infusion is the more correct word. Um, you can, with the bark or the twigs, I would actually uh, simmer it. Um, with the leaves, you could just, just make a strong, uh, long infusion with it. Yeah, and just gargle with it. Drinking it can plug you up, but it's a tissue toner. The tannins tighten the tissues. What did you tell them? Like he's asking about the benefits. What did you tell him about? Uh, for a mouthwash or in particular. It's an antimicrobial. And it, in in many well. cases, it's considered to be an antiviral mm-hmm. and an antiseptic. So antiseptics in particular, like you could spray it on your countertop as your cleanser. If you decoct it, it will stain your countertops over time. The grapple will be Definitely. Yeah. If you decoct, <laughs> you put some lemon juice in it because the lemon's bleaching. Yeah. If you decoct it, it's, so that's more than an infusion. An infusion, the crap out of it. An infusion or a tea. Yeah. yeah, okay. So decoct it, keep the lid on, and boil the crap out of it so the water looks nasty and it tastes like all. Then that's great. You save it in ice cream trays. You have the ice cream trays and it's warm. You don't pull one out until you need it. And it lasts until it's hot. If you use it in that way, it's also the tissue, so it's going to stop any kind of bleeding. But that antiseptic property, when you think about what's going on in your mouth or out in the world or wound washing, Something, but the other thing is that the tissue is not with the intestine, it would be closing up a wound that was that was bleeding, the tissue, it would be steroids, it would be anything that was collapsing or falling down. It would even go 
really want to monkey your eyes. Like, you know, people pay for expensive training. <laughs> and now, really, it's just preparation needs their own. Like, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. You'll cinch it right out, for sure. Yeah. You know, we, we talk about sitz baths. You know, some of you might have heard of sitz bath. It's where you put some kind of herb or tissue toner so for, a, for a hemorrhoids, and you sit your ass in the bucket. That's what a sitz bath is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Oh, yeah, oak is great, but history, so, so look up white oak because it'll always be listed as white oak in her bark or something like that. And so, it, it's, I'm not that picky. It's interchangeable. Yeah. All of yeah. us are used the same way, and they're considered to be elders like they knew all the knowledge. That's the point. Yeah, oak, oak trees make people cry. You, you set somebody for an hour under a live oak tree, and, and the their granddaddy or their grandma is going to talk to them. Yeah, for real. Thank you all so much for giving up your Friday evening. I hope we see you again or something. Bye, y'all. Hope you see you for the next class.